pastors with backbone, pastors with spines, pulpits that preach the truth of God, the whole counsel of God, the gospel of God, as Dan said, not only to help man get to heaven, but to get a little heaven into men. That in this day, we can be that salt and light. We can be that change agent. We can go out into the world and have a message that is effective. And so I'm really, really excited this morning. I know I say this. I don't know how many times I get up in the pulpit. I'm so excited. I, I am. But I, this for me is a dream come true. And I pray and last night after the presentation that he gave, everybody come up and they're like, I didn't know. I had no idea. It was like the blinders had been ripped off. It was revelation to his church. So I uh, now am so excited to introduce to you your pastor for the day, Pastor Dan Fisher. Thank you. Thank you so much. How are you? Everybody good? Well, I bring greetings from Oklahoma. I'm so glad to be in your wonderful state, and I'm looking forward to sharing with you this morning. Now, I know that a number of you were here last night, and we are delighted that you were here, and I hope you enjoyed the presentation. If you were not able to come last night, then you really missed probably the highlight of this entire weekend that I'm with you. So I, I hate to bear bad news to you if you weren't here. But if you were not here and you would like to learn the story of the pastors who literally birthed America. You know, we always talk about the founders and the framers and obviously they were critical. Men like Washington and Madison and Jefferson and all those guys. But ultimately it was the preachers. And so last night in period costume, I actually acted out uh, some of the lives of these men and shared the incredible story of how they recruited the men from their churches and led them off to fight, which seems to be so antithetical to what we uh, see pastors doing today. And part of that is because pastors have lost that kind of passion and that kind of conviction. But if you were not here, and even if you were, obviously, these are available to you, but I have a DVD that pretty much shows everything that I did last night on location. I am in period costume, we use reenactors, all kinds of things, uh, so it's very, very usable, especially for those who won't read the book, but they'll watch the movie. And so this is about a 90-minute docudrama. The very last 15 minutes is where I'm being interviewed by one of the Hollywood actors who helps us in this docudrama. And what I'm trying to do in that interview is to show how the principles of the 18th century translate to the 21st century. So if you're interested in the DVD, it is back there. But this is the one that I would recommend to you highly. This is the story of the Black Robed Regiment. It took me two years of doing the research to put this together. Now, it's not the whole story because I'm still uncovering all kinds of pastors and their stories. And so one of these days, there may be a sequel to this book. But if you want to know the story of how the pastors and their congregations got it done, this is the book that you want. It'll be back there at the table as well, and I, I welcome you to uh, come back there once we're finished. And then the other book that I have back there is the session that I'm going to be teaching this morning. It is a book about Romans 13, verses 1 through 5. It's entitled Unlimited Submission, as you can see on the screen, how Romans 13, 1 through 5 has been incorrectly used to silence Christians in the church. So that book is back there as well, and I just wanted you to know, so if you, especially if you were not able to be here last night, then these two are kind of a must if you really want to know the story. And I want to thank Pastor Mike and his wife and your, uh, your whole staff for having me here and for how helpful and uh, hospitable you have been. It's been a pleasure, guys, so thank you, brother, for having me here. It is a, a privilege. Well, let's get to the uh, subject matter today. Let me tell you just a little bit about myself. For those of you who are here last night, you already know, but I grew up in western Arkansas. I became a believer at the age of eight. I was called to preach at the age of 10. I started preaching when I was 16. By the time I was 22, I was full-time on staff in a fairly large church in a town called Fort Smith, Arkansas. And then by the time I was 23, I was senior pastor of my very first church. And I've been at it all of those years. I turned 64 
this past August. So you do the math. I've been preaching well over 40 years. And through this whole time, obviously, I'm committed to the gospel. Getting men and women from earth to heaven is the most important thing. We would all agree on that. But that's not all of the gospel. The gospel also includes, as Brother Mike said a while ago, getting heaven into men and women on the earth. And there's where I think the church has failed. See, I think the church, by and large, has done a pretty good job of delivering the John 3.16 message, right? I think we've done a pretty good job with that. What we haven't done a good job with is making disciples. And it's interesting in the Great Commission, Jesus doesn't tell the church, go make converts. He doesn't say that. He says, go make what? Go make disciples. And there's a big difference. And then Jesus talks about the qualities, the characteristics of a disciple, that you take up your cross daily, which is an instrument of, of execution. You die to yourself. You follow him daily. He says, one who takes hold of the plow using a farmer's illustration, but then looks back is not worthy to be my disciple. So you, you begin to discover that discipleship is a journey, it's a marathon, it's a struggle, and it's an ongoing process, and most of us stop. We stop somewhere early on. I don't know where most people stop, but we stop, and that is not what God has for us. And so part of my message, I am a co-pastor of a church in Edmond, Oklahoma, Anybody in here ever been to Edmond, Oklahoma? Would you lift your hand? Oh, man, there's some, there's some saints right there. Everybody else? I'm not sure about you. Well, Edmond is just north of Oklahoma City. I actually live west of Oklahoma City, but I co-pastor there with a man named Paul Blair. He and I have been working together for years trying to awaken the church and the pulpit to our responsibility to engage in the culture war. And we do these Liberty Pastor training camps where we give the nuts and bolts of how pastors and church leaders and ultimately congregations can apply these principles. So what's happening here today and last night is you're getting the biggest part of day one of our camp that we offer to our pastors. So you're getting to see some of the things that your pastor was able to see and others from your staff that uh, came to the camp. But I believe that it is critical that we engage. We must engage. And so I am here this weekend to, to share that message. Now, this afternoon, I'm going to be sharing two other very important sessions. These three sessions, the one this morning and the two that I'm going to have on the screen for you in just a second, are what I believe to be the greatest roadblocks to pastors and churches engaging in the fight. Now, I know that you all are engaging. You have the salt and light ministry, your pastor's leading out. But all of us need to understand how important it is that every one of us do our job to pick up our part of, of the task and run forward. And so I'm going to be talking about the myth of separation of church and state. Notice the word myth is bigger than the rest of it. Because all of my life, I've been told that you can't talk about certain things in church. That's off limits. Can't talk about politics. And so for years, pastors have not given the biblical view of proper governance. And because of that, Christians are disengaged. They think it's a sin to get involved in politics. They don't think they ought to run for office. Most Christians don't even vote. Half of Christians in America don't vote. 15%, I mean, excuse me, 15 million of the some 90 million born-again Christians, or at least they claim to be born again, 15 million of those 90 aren't even registered to vote. So about 45 to 50 million born-again Christians in America don't even vote. So it's no wonder why we have the mess that we have in our country today. So it is so critical that we engage and then the other session that I'll be teaching, both of these obviously are after our lunch that we'll have here, so I encourage you to stay. I'm going to be dealing with the subject of the church, the IRS, and the Johnson Amendment. How many times have you heard somebody say, well, if we speak out, the IRS will come shut our church down? Or, man, if we get engaged, the IRS is going to take away our nonprofit status. And doesn't the Johnson Amendment say that churches can't speak out? Well, we're going to deal with that, and hopefully when we're finished this afternoon, you're going to understand what the church can do, must do, and you're going to find out just how little 
the IRS can actually do. But we've been intimidated so much so that we either won't speak out or we won't allow our pastors to speak out. And that is an important um, error that we need to correct. So I encourage you to stay with us. Uh, Pastor Mike's already said that there's lunch here for you, and we'd love to have you. Now, what time are we going to reconvene? 12.30. So we're going to reconvene at 12.30. Now, I thought it would be interesting for you to see the before and after effects of makeup. Hollywood can work miracles. I know you know that. This is a before makeup, and this is after makeup. (laughs) Just so you know what kind of miracles Hollywood can work. And then we also have to have our terms correct. So notice that this is weed and these are dopes. And understand there is is a big difference. Also, this is a hyena. This is a laughing hyena. So you always want to get the terms right, okay? want to be right about it. Okay, all right. I want you to listen to William Booth. Most of you uh, know him as the founder of the Salvation Army, and most of us think all there is to the Salvation Army is ringing bells with a red pot outside of Walmart in December. The truth is the Salvation Army has been one of the most evangelical, evangelistic organizations in many, many decades. William Booth, of course, lived in the 1800s, and I want you to listen to what he said. He said, the chief danger of the 20th century will be religion without the Holy Ghost, Christianity without Christ, forgiveness without repentance, salvation without regeneration, politics without God, and heaven without hell. Man, did he have our age pegged. We're living all of those, all of those contradictions. Now, the truth is you can't have it that way. Christianity will not allow us, not true faith uh, will allow us to have, for instance, religion without the Holy Ghost, Christianity without Christ. There is no Christianity without Christ. Forgiveness without repentance, salvation without regeneration, and politics without religion. You, you, You can't work that, and of course, you can't have heaven without hell. But folks have rewritten the, the, uh, the, the Word of God, of course, we can't do that really, and God warns us about it. But we've rewritten the Word of God, and we teach and believe things that we shouldn't teach and we shouldn't believe. So let's talk about Romans 13. Let's talk about whether or not it's a sin for you to stand up against tyrants. Is it a sin? Well, didn't Paul say it, Romans 13? So how many of you heard somebody say something like that? You're a Christian, and it's your duty under God to submit to government no matter what, and you're sinning if you don't. Have you ever either heard that or been led to believe that? Or how about something like this? Our founders and our framers were sinning when they defied England and eventually formed what we know of today as the United States of America, that we actually were sinning when we stood up against the red coats. Or how about this? Well, since Jesus, Paul, and the other apostles didn't get involved in their government or call for their followers to rebel against the tyranny of their day, all Christians should stay out of politics and submit to whatever government they find themselves living under. Man, I've heard that one a jillion times. If I had a dollar for every time I heard somebody say, well, Jesus didn't get involved in the government. Paul didn't get involved in government. Uh, The other apostles, which really that is debatable because I actually believe they did, but you hear this over and over, and so therefore we're not supposed to. That's a dirty business. Well, I found out that as a Christian, you can actually chew gum and walk at the same time. And so while I was pastoring a church of over 1,000 people, I also got elected to the Oklahoma legislature and served in the Oklahoma House of Representatives while continuing to pastor and traveling around the country doing the black robe presentation that I did last night. I also later ran for governor of Oklahoma, and we ran a really good race and did really well. Didn't get elected, but we got a message out there that no one else would would have articulated. And you can do all that and still be faithful to the Lord. In fact, I believe by doing those things, we are being faithful to the Lord. We must engage. So, What about this Romans 13? Well, pastors for years have taught that Paul said you have to knuckle under. Now, I'm going to give you 
a couple of quotes from Dr. John MacArthur. But let me preface this by saying I have the greatest respect for Dr. MacArthur. I have a lot of his books in my library. I think he is a solid man of God, and I believe he's probably one of the greatest teachers and preachers of our era. And yet, at least he used to believe what the typical Christian has been told. So I want you to listen to this quote. It's from an article and from a message that he preached. The actual footnotes are there at the bottom of the screen. He said, to some people, evangelical Christianity was a proper justification for the American Revolution. They believe we had every right to load up our guns and kill Englishmen for the sake of our religious freedom. So the United States was actually born out of a violation of the New Testament principles. And any blessings that God has bestowed on America have come in spite of that disobedience by the founding fathers. So basically MacArthur at least used to preach and teach that it's a sin to stand up against tyrants. Now notice he says that the colonists thought it was okay to load their guns and go kill Englishmen. Let me clear up something. The colonists considered themselves Englishmen. They didn't consider themselves Americans. That came later. They were Englishmen and women. They believed the king and the parliament had violated the English Bill of Rights, the English Constitution, the charters with the colonies, and they had petitioned and petitioned and given redress after redress to the uh, uh, government of, of Great Britain and the king and the parliament turned a deaf ear. Not only did they ignore them, they turned up the heat and persecuted them more and more. So when Paul Revere is making his famous ride, he's not yelling, the British are coming. That'd be like you or me looking out the door and seeing a military convoy and yelling, the Americans are coming. We are Americans. Revere was saying, the regulars are out. The regulars are coming. They considered themselves Englishmen. So first of all, MacArthur was wrong at, the, at that point. But he's also wrong about the fact that the, the framers and the founders were actually sinning when they did what they did. Now, I have good news for you. During the COVID charade, California tried to shut John MacArthur's church down. You know what he did? He bowed up and fought. And eventually he took them to court and won so maybe John, once they tried to shut his church down, began to realize, oops, maybe it's not always wrong to stand up against tyrants. So to his defense, I believe probably he has altered his position. But that's what I've heard all of my life. So let's just think about it for a moment. These men that signed the Declaration of Independence, according to most preachers and Christians over the years, were sinning. That they, were in, they were in disobedience to God. Really? So the United States was actually founded out of disobedience to the New Testament, as MacArthur used to teach? No, that's not true. We're going to deal with that. So first of all, I think it's important to understand that believers have not always believed in unlimited submission to government. Let's, let's just real quickly think of some examples. How about the Hebrew midwives that refused to obey Pharaoh by drowning all of the Jewish baby boys. God not only uh, allowed them to do that, he applauded them for it. What about Moses refusing Pharaoh? What about Queen Esther, who approached the throne of the king without an invitation, which could have brought the death penalty on her? She's breaking the law, and yet she's doing it to save her people. How about the three asbestos boys? They wouldn't bend, they wouldn't bow, they wouldn't burn. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Well, they disobeyed God. They wouldn't bow in front of Nebuchadnezzar's idol, and yet God applauds. How about Daniel defying the 30-day prayer decree that you can only pray to the God of Nebuchadnezzar for 30 days? It was kind of like this, just give us 30 days to flatten the curve. Have you heard that before? Yeah, so see, that kind of nonsense is not new. Daniel prayed as he always had, and notice God honors him, and so do we. What about Jesus when he refused to abide by the Jewish Sabbath laws that the rabbis had put in place? Not, not the laws of God, the laws that the rabbis had added. Jesus refused to obey them. But those laws were just as binding as the Roman laws, and yet Jesus said no. In fact, he went on to say that by your laws, you have attempted to nullify God's law. How about the apostles and the early Christians who refused to stay silent about their faith? Many of them were martyred, and we celebrate their witness today, and of course God approved of it. Or how about the believers throughout the ages? 
who have stood against the bad guys. So, for instance, look at these people. Now, we typically call them pilgrims, and I think we need to correct our vocabulary. They were actually separatists who we have labeled pilgrims. We celebrate every November, coming up here pretty soon, Thanksgiving. Well, these people were devoted Christians, and they believed the Church of England was so corrupt that it couldn't be purified, so they weren't Puritans. They believed you should come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. They were separatists. Let me clear up another misnomer. Most people believe that the pilgrims fled England looking for religious liberty. Actually, they fled England and went to Holland. They'd been in Holland for 12 years. They came to the new world, according to them, to further the gospel. So we've gotten our history all jumbled up. And by the way, this painting is what is called the embarkation of the pilgrims. It hangs in the Capitol Rotunda in D.C. today. And notice, there's their elder, Elder Brewster. There's uh, Robinson, their first uh, uh, governor. And here they are gathered. And notice, these aren't a bunch of single men going for conquest and gold. These are families. They're going to, new, to the new world to live. And notice what's right in the center of the painting. God's Word, the Geneva Bible. So these people were breaking the law. Did you know their first attempt to leave England, many of them were arrested? Most people don't know that. If you've watched uh, Kirk Cameron's monumental documentary, you know a little more about these separatists than what the, the typical Christian does. So were these people sinning? Because I guess if they were, we need to ignore this coming Thanksgiving. Or how about these guys? We talked a lot about them last night, the Lexington Minutemen. Standing up against the tyrants from Great Britain. They didn't fire the first shot. The British did. They returned fire. Their, their fight was defensive. Were they sinning? How about this lady? You say, well, who's she? Well, that's a young, a photograph of a young Corey Ten Boom. Do you know her story? Yeah, she and her family helped to save hundreds and hundreds of Jews from the Nazis. And get this, her family was not even Jewish. They were Dutch. Her whole family was imprisoned, including Corey, but she was the only one who survived. So I guess she was sinning by disobeying the government in Germany. How about this guy? That's a Lutheran preacher. His name is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was in America and went back to Germany to help and tried to stop the Nazis and was involved in all kinds of uh, underground uh, attempts to assassinate Hitler and get rid of the Nazis. They finally hanged him using a piano string out of a piano. Well, was he sinning? No. In fact, as a Lutheran pastor, he wrote numerous books that are still used today all over the country. How about this guy? You may not recognize him, but you may have seen the movie. That's Oscar Schindler. Have you ever seen Schindler's List? Yeah, this is the Jewish man who actually saved over a thousand Jews using his own personal wealth to do so. Was he sinning? How about this guy? Martin Luther King Jr. Now, he did it peacefully, but he stood up against the Jim Crow laws of the 50s and 60s. Those laws were just as official as any of the other laws, and yet they were immoral, and he believed he had the moral uh, ground and the, the, the call from God to stand up, and I'm thankful that he did. We celebrate what he did every year by observing his birthday. But according to most preachers and Christians, he was sinning. How about this guy? You may not know him, but that's Justice Taney out of the 1800s, Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court. He said that that black man was not a man, but he was property. He's not a person, he's property. That's Dred Scott. Was that correct? That Dred Scott was not a person and should, could, could be treated like uh, common cattle or horses or chickens or pigs? Well, of course that was wrong. And if we had been alive then, would we have said, well, Supreme Court said it, so I guess that's the law of the land. Or would we have stood up and said, no, this is wrong. I mean, it's obvious. You can just go down the list. So would it have been wrong to help to free individuals like that? No, of course not. How about is it wrong to protect the life of the unborn? 
Because up until just a few months ago, the U.S. Supreme Court said that our Constitution says it's okay to murder these preborn babies. Many of us have stood up against that as abolitionists and said this is not only sinful and wrong, it's abhorrent and any people that would allow this ought to be wiped off the face of the earth. So was it wrong to step up and say no? So ultimately, are we left to just cross our fingers and just pray and hope that our government does the right thing and I just hope that we keep the right Supreme Court so we can keep getting the right decision because if they decide wrong, Romans 13 says we've just got to go along with it. Of course not. That is ridiculous. And yet the average Christian cannot defend this argument. So let's talk about it here. Let's get into the details. First of all, Romans 13 is not the only passage in the New Testament that talks about submitting to government. There are numerous passages. And let me also say here before I go any further, don't misunderstand that I'm teaching that we ought to be rebellious in our, in our hearts and go around just thumbing our noses up at authority. No, the Bible teaches that if authority is proper, we have a responsibility to submit to it. So I don't want you to think that I'm trying to communicate that we don't have to submit to authority. No, if the authority is proper, we have a responsibility to submit. But there are many passages, and here's three of them right here, but the passage of choice has always been Romans 13. That's the passage that every preacher uses. That's probably the passage that John MacArthur was thinking of when he said that the, the colonists and the framers were all sinning when they stood up against the British and uh, God has blessed America, but it didn't because of that, because it was birthed out of sin. Is that right? No, of course it's wrong. So what did Paul actually say when he wrote Romans 13? Well, there's the passage. The first five verses, I'm not going to read all that to you, but we are going to come back to a section of it in just a moment. But if you'll notice, the first two verses talk about authority in general. Where does authority come from? And Paul says authority comes from God. And then verses 3, all the way down here to the end of verse 4, he talks about the purpose of government and then verse 5 he talks about what happens when we disobey proper authority the judgment that we may face so I'm going to focus on a number of things and so to, to help us kind of you know collate this in our brains I'm just going to I'm going to use a number of points so let's let's look at point number one context is critical context is critical now that is an important principle that you need to always know and practice. When you're reading the Bible, read everything in context. Uh, over the years as a believer, I've heard so many Christians yank verses out of the Bible and say, this is my personal verse, and they interpret it to mean something that that passage isn't even saying. Wasn't even addressed to what they're talking about. They're not considering the context. In fact, if you're willing to ignore the context, you can make the Bible say anything you want it to say. I mean, you can, you can just literally teach anything because you're just yanking passages from here and there and just, just put them all together and make them into a collage and this is my belief and, and it's not biblically consistent at all. So context is everything. Now, the reason why that's important with the Romans 13 d discussion is because a lot of people say, well, since Paul wrote Romans while Nero was the emperor of Rome and we know that Nero was a tyrant, Paul was saying to the Roman Christians, you've got to submit to a tyrant. That makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, if he wrote it when Nero was a tyrant, and then he said submit to the Roman authorities, he must be saying submit to tyrants. Well, context is important. First of all, you need to know that Paul wrote the book of Romans somewhere around 56 to 57 AD. Okay, now you say, well, I don't know that I'll remember that. Well, it's important for this point. It wasn't until about 64 A.D. or a little later that Nero revealed the beast within. Up until then, he was kind of peacefully coexisting with the Christians. So before 64 A.D., you really wouldn't have called Nero a monster. You wouldn't have called him the tyrant that we know him to be today. You know, he's the one that... Rome catches on fire. Many believe he may have had the fire set 
burns it all down and he kind of fiddles while Rome is burning and he blames it all on the Christians and then declares holy war against the Christians and they're being burned at the stake and turned into human torches to light the Appian Way, which was the great uh, highway there in Rome. He did horrible things, but those things didn't start until after 64 AD. So within context, when Paul tells the Roman Christians to submit to authority, Nero is not the tyrant. Now, he, he is internally, but he isn't acting like the tyrant toward the Christians that he's going to. Now, I think that is very important. That is significant. The second point is a question. Were Paul and Peter hypocrites? You say, well, why in the world would you ask that? The answer was obviously no. Well, let's stop for just a moment. Peter, in his letter that we call the book or the letter of 1 Peter chapter 2, basically says the same thing that Paul says in Romans 13, that you need to submit to authorities. So, how could they have been hypocrites? Well, if Peter and Paul were both teaching that we must offer unlimited submission to every governmental authority, how can we reconcile that with the examples I just gave you a while ago? That of godly people who disobeyed tyrants and God applauded them like the Hebrew midwives and the three asbestos boys and Daniel. You just go down the list. Isn't that inconsistent? Aren't Peter and Paul contradicting the Old Testament? And besides that, how about the fact that Peter and Paul themselves were often at odds with the government and it got so bad they both were martyred? I don't think you would call that complying, would you? I mean, they were so non-compliant that they ended up getting themselves executed. Well, then how did they ask us to be unlimited, uh, to offer unlimited submission to government? But they wouldn't. Wouldn't that make them hypocrites? It would, unless they weren't saying that. And my argument is they weren't saying that. So were Paul and Peter hypocrites? Well, the answer is no, not if you understand properly what they wrote. The third point, in Romans chapter 13, Paul differentiates between a tyranny and what I call a proper, and I think that's very important, a proper government. So I want to read two verses to you out of Romans 13. I want to read verses 3 and 4. I want you to listen to what they say. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Well, then do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he, meaning the person in government, for he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister. That's the second time that he has said that. An avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. That's the second time that he said that. Now, let's just think for a moment. Does it sink with you for me to say that Nancy Pelosi is a minister of the Lord? How about Chuck Schumer? Minister from the Lord. How about Joe Biden? Minister from the Lord. Bill Clinton? Minister from the Lord. I mean, no. Well, then how does Paul say that Leaders in government are God's minister. Well, it would only be true if they were ministering properly, if they were governing properly. So here are the characteristics that Paul lays down of the proper government that we should willingly and, and, and uh, gladly submit to. Number one, that kind of government acts as God's minister for good. So the first characteristic of a proper government is that it's doing good. Its purpose is to do good, not to leave our borders wide open so any terrorist and jihadist and anybody else can illegally just walk across the Rio Grande and be given all the goodies paid for by our hard-earned tax dollars and then eventually just disperse into the country and create sleeper, sleeper cells all over. You realize that we have sleeper cells everywhere in the United States. They're all over Oklahoma. We're one of the reddest states in the Union. I guarantee you they're all over Idaho, and they're all over the other 48 states. Now, what would happen if somehow they're coordinated well enough 
that there could be a text message sent out to the leaders of all of those cell groups. And on a given day at a particular time, they do hear what just happened in Israel. You think it couldn't happen here? You think that we wouldn't be caught flat-footed just like the Israelis were? You bet we could be. Don't forget 9-11. And that was just a handful of terrorists. What if we have a few million terrorists in America? You say, well, how could we have a few million? Well, just during Joe Biden's first two and a half years, he's allowed some eight million illegals to come across our border and they're not being vetted. So if just one-eighth of them are terrorists, that's a million now, just imagine how much damage a million, I don't know what the number would be. I don't know how many terrorists have crossed the, the, the border illegally. But what kind of damage do you think a million terrorists who are bent on murdering the infidel, which is America, we're the greater infidel, Israel is the lesser infidel in their minds, what kind of damage do you think a million terrorists, all fully armed to the teeth, turned loose at the same time, how much damage could they do across the country? Yeah, so notice the characteristic of a proper government is their, their mission is to do good. Secondly, he says, a proper government avenges evil by executing wrath on evildoers. To put it plainly, they punish the bad guys. That's a characteristic of a proper government. They go after the bad guys. Unfortunately, in America today, we have a two-tier justice system. You see, if you're conservative then you are public enemy number one and they'll watch you like a hawk and if you barely stump your toe, they're coming after you with the full force of the FBI, the CIA, the, the Homeland Defense, you name it. I mean, there is a pro-life family who just a few months ago, just because the father defended his 11-year-old son out in front of one of these killing places that they call abortion clinics, the guy kept harassing the, the man's son, and he'd ask him over and over, please leave my son alone. Remember, 11-year-old kid, he's a minor. This is an adult man. And by the way, this adult man is what they call a tumbler. Now, I don't know if you know what a tumbler is, but they're kind of like ambulance chasers. They go around looking for places where there's going to be controversy, and then if somebody just yells at them or reaches out to them, they just fall down and act like they're hurt, and then they want to uh, you know, launch some kind of lawsuit. That man defended his son. By the way, he never struck the guy that was harassing his son. But in a few weeks, the FBI showed up at that man's house, and there were over 20 FBI agents with fully auto uh, AR-15s, which would be you know, a little different in the military version, with the full SWAT gear and the whole deal, they, they came into his house without a warrant, dragged that man outside, handcuffed him while his little children are screaming, while the man is begging, please don't make a scene here in front of my kids. I'll go peacefully. They strong-armed him, threw him in the back of a squad car, took him down to the police station, booked him and did all this kind of stuff. He had to post bail to get out, and only after months of defending himself in court was he able to prove that he was innocent of any crime now that's happening across the country it's just that the, the the lamestream news media will not share any of these things you're not going to read that in the in the in the new york slimes or the washington compost or the pms nbc or any of that stuff you're not you're not going to hear about these stories you're going to have to dig to find those so when a government punishes the bad guy see if you're hunter biden you can do anything you can do anything. You can even be so dumb to leave your computer at a computer uh, uh, a repair store with all of your pornographic pictures and information and all that still on the computer, and the FBI can have it and claim, well, boy, it's just taking us a long time to figure out this computer. What? It takes them a few hours to come after a guy like me. But with Hunter, they've got his computer. Well, we just don't know. We just, we're, we're working on it. You can do that kind of stuff and take millions in bribes, even have your father on video holding the government of Ukraine blackmail. No problem. Nothing to see here. You can be Hillary Clinton 
and use what is called bleach bit to get rid of all of the information on the hard drives of your computers and have your staff take all of your cell phones and crush them with hammers and then the FBI and the CIA say, oh, oh nothing, nothing to see here. You can store classified documents in your garage beside your Corvette and have them stacked in boxes where anybody, including Hunter, has access to them. And that's not a problem, but you can keep the same kind of documents at Mar-a-Lago locked down where the government has actually uh, looked at the room and said the only thing we suggest is add additional locks, which they had done. You can have those documents, and buddy, you're going to jail. So you can see that in our country, we really don't have the kind of government that goes after the bad guys. And then the last characteristic of, of a proper government is it, it rewards and protects the good guys. Now guys, those are the three characteristics that Paul gives for a proper government. Number one, its purpose is to do good. Number two, it punishes the bad guys. And number three, it rewards the good guys. Now that's not very hard to, uh, to understand, is it? I mean, you could all uh, repeat that right now. Now, that's what Paul says the government is. So, what have we historically believed about standing up against tyrants? Well, if you go back to the first Great Awakening, you remember that great revival that came through America right before the War of Independence? If you go back to that period of time, Jonathan Mayhew was one of the rock stars among the preachers. Now, most of us have never even heard of him. That's because we don't know anything about our history. We've not been taught in school. We don't have any desire to know. So we walk around ignorant of who we are. And, and, and according to what God says in the book of Hosea, we're, we're destroyed because of our lack of knowledge. We just don't know. But I want you to listen to what this preacher said. He said, no government is to be submitted to at the expense of that which is the sole end of government. What's that? the common good and safety of society. The only reason of the institution of civil government and the only rational ground of submission to it is the common safety and utility, what we call welfare. And I don't mean a welfare check. I mean everybody's welfare. If, therefore, in any case, the common safety and utility would not be promoted by submission to government, but the contrary, there is no ground or motive for obedience and submission, but for the contrary. Well, what's the contrary of obedience and submission? Standing up, saying, not on my watch. He goes on to say, but the duty of unlimited obedience, whether active or passive, can be argued neither from the manner of expression here used nor from the general scope and design of the passage. Now, this is what's happening. Between 1749 and 1750, Mayhew preaches a series of sermons that he ultimately has in, has in what we call a booklet. He's talking about unlimited submission. And he's preaching about Romans 13. And notice what he's saying. You do not owe unlimited submission to government. Now, that's what people used to hear all of the time in the churches. We don't hear that anymore, but that's what they used to hear from the pulpit. He goes on to say, when once magistrates act contrary to their office and the end of their institution, remember, what is their office? To do good, punish the bad guys, reward the good guys. When they rob and ruin the public, Instead of being guardians of its peace and welfare, they immediately cease to be the ordinance and ministers of God and no more deserve that glorious character than common pirates and highwaymen, what we would call robbers and thieves and thugs. So notice what that first great awakening preacher is saying. When the government does the opposite of what Paul says it's supposed to be doing, they're just mafia. They're, they're, they're gangsters. They're thugs, they're, they're, they're robbers, they're thieves. What do you think Jonathan Mayhew would say about our government today? He would stand right here and tell you, not only do you not have an obligation under God to do what they say, you have an obligation under God to stand up and say, no, that's wrong. Now, don't misunderstand. I'm not saying that we need to load up the guns and just go find the local government official, maybe the postman or somebody like that, or uh, you know, county clerk, and shoot them. I've had people ask me, Dan, when do you think it's time to load our guns? And I say, well, every day. You need to always keep them loaded. No, I mean, when do you think we need to march? I say, well, who are you going to shoot? You're going to hide behind your bushes in your house, and when the postman comes up, pop him? I mean, 
I mean, that is not what resisting tyranny looks like. If you go back to the times when Americans have stood up against the government, they did it through their colonies or their state. The way it would be proper for us to stand up would be if your state stood up and said to the federal government, no way. And by the way, they have more than enough grounds to do that. Oklahoma should be doing that right now. Texas should be monitoring their own border. I don't care what they say about the federal constitution giving that responsibility to the federal government. If I was Governor Abbott, I can tell you who would be down at that, that border right now. The National Guard, because I would have called them out and I would stop that illegal immigration immediately. So it is time, it is time for us to realize that Paul did not teach that we just roll over and play dead. So number four, believers are not sinning when they resist tyrants in their tyranny. Now, the Bible has a lot to be, uh, say about submission to authority, but Paul also says that it's not always possible. Look at Romans 12, 18. If, notice that word, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Now, what does he clearly imply? that it's not always possible. If it's possible, but what do you do when it's not possible? You stand up. You don't just sit there and say, well, Romans 13 says I just got to take it on the chin. So I'm just going to sit here and be the quiet little pious Christian that Romans 13 says I'm supposed to be. And if they want to come in, I've even heard preachers say that if a burglar broke into their house and was armed and knew that he or they intended their family harm, they wouldn't defend their family. They'd sit there and pray while those burglars uh, molested uh, his wife or their children or ransacked their house. He'd just sit there and pray. Let me tell you what I'd do. I'd fire off as many shots as I had in my firearm, and then I'd pray that God will watch over me, and that's when I would pray. In fact, you can have my gun, but when you get it, it will be hot and empty because that's exactly what we ought to do. But I hear preachers say, well, I just sit there and pray. Well, these guys ransack your house and murder your family member. Well, I just pray. God tells us to not be, uh, you know, militant. In fact, I've had guys tell me, man, I can't let you do black robe presentation in my church. I say, why not? It's too militant. That, that, that word regiment, it's just too militant. It just scares people. Let me tell you what ought to scare you. What ought to scare you is the fact that tyrants are in the process of stealing your liberties away. And once they get enough of them, my friend, your world is going to change drastically. So we must understand what Scripture says. Now, I need to hurry up here because I realize I'm running out of time. But the Bible talks about submission to authority in a lot of other places. And it didn't refer to government. How about Ephesians 5.22 where the, Paul says that wives are to submit to their husbands. Does that mean unlimited submission? So does that mean if the husband comes in and uh, he's hot and tired and he wants a six-pack of Dr. Pepper, he throws his wife a 45 caliber and says, go down to the, the, the local convenience store and, and rob them and bring me back a six-pack of ice-cold Dr. Peppers. She says, okay, honey, I got to submit. And so she goes down there and does it. Of course not. Nobody teaches that wives are to submit to their husbands in an unlimited fashion. What about Ephesians chapter 6 verse 1 where it says that children are to submit to their parents? Does that mean if the parents on Friday afternoon bring the kids in the living room and say, Kids, look, we're a little short on cash this month. Here's a couple of bags of cocaine. Would you go out on the street and sell it for us so we can raise some money to pay the electricity bill? And the kids say, well, Okay, i got to submit to my parents. So they go out and become drug dealers. No, nobody would read that passage of Scripture that way. How about where Paul tells Timothy that the congregation is supposed, supposed to submit to their pastors and their spiritual leaders? Does that mean if your pastor becomes a scoundrel or if your pastor becomes a heretic that you're stuck with him and you just have to submit till he finally decides he's going to go elsewhere to a bigger church with a, higher, a larger paycheck? No, let me tell you what you're to do. You're to kick his rear end out onto the curb and tell him to hit the road jack and don't come back no more, no more, no more and go find a godly man that can lead your church. But you see, if, if we read every submission passage as unlimited, that's how we'd have to interpret these passages. Isn't it funny that the only one that we say is unlimited submission is Romans 13? You know why? I can tell you why. Because we're cowards. 
we're cowards. We've had it so good for so long, we're so soft that we don't do anything to make waves. That's the number one reason why most pastors won't deal with subjects like this. Why most pastors won't have me do black robe in their churches because it'll make waves. And see, they get up every Sunday and they say, now Lord, I, I, folks, I want you to know the Lord is nice. And his word is so nice. And in his nice word, he asks us all to be nice. And if you'd just be nice, this would be a nice place. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> and that's the kind of message that these guys are hearing Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. Christian psychology, four ways to be this, five ways to be a better you. Every day's Friday. You can have your best life now, all that kind of stuff. Tell that to the persecuted Christians around the world. It's a bunch of nonsense. So isn't it interesting how we can get it right? Now, preachers have not always preached the way we do now. In our history, there were preachers who did not offer unlimited submission. Now, I can't read every one of these quotes that I have left on here, but this one I've got to read to you. This is a preacher named Samuel West, as you can see. He pastored in Boston. He preached this sermon to the legislature of Massachusetts. I don't know if you've ever heard what, a, what an election sermon is, but in the old days, after all the elections took place in the fall, they would invite a local preacher to come down to the legislature, and they'd have the House of Representatives, the Senate, the governor, the lieutenant governor, all there, and he'd get up there, and for about an hour and a half, he'd warn them that they were going to answer to God for the way they governed that year. You think that'd make any difference in our, our legislatures? I mean, they'd let them have it, and then they'd watch over them like a hawk all through the governing year, and if they messed up, they'd go down there and let them have it again. So he's preaching to the legislature when he says what I'm about to read to you. He says, a slavish submission to tyranny is proof of a very sordid and base mind. All good magistrates, while they faithfully discharge the trust reposed in them, ought to be religiously and conscientiously obeyed. The reason why the magistrate is called the minister of God is because he is to protect, encourage, and honor them that do well and to punish them that do evil. Remember Paul's qualifications? Therefore, it is our duty to submit to them, not merely, he says, for the fear of being punished by them, but out of regard to the divine authority under which they are deputed to execute judgment and to do justice. If magistrates are no farther ministers of God than they promote the good of the community, then obedience to them neither is nor can be unlimited. For it would imply a gross absurdity to assert that when magistrates are ordained by the people solely for the purpose of being beneficial to the state, they must be obeyed when they are seeking to ruin and to destroy it. Unlimited submission and obedience is due to none but God alone. Whenever then the ruler encourages them that do evil, that's the opposite of what Paul said. Now he's saying when they begin to reward the bad guys, and is a terror to those that do well, so now they're punishing the good guys. As soon as he becomes a tyrant, that's what a tyrant is. He punishes the good guys, rewards the bad guys. He forfeits his authority to govern and becomes the minister of Satan. See, that's what needs to be preached in Congress today, both in your legislature and in D.C., we ought to tell them, you guys are ministers of Satan. You're doing the exact opposite of what God's word says. And he says, and as such, ought to be opposed. So you see, it wasn't always preached that we need to submit to authority in an unlimited fashion. And then Mayhew, Mayhew goes on to say that common tyrants and public oppressors are not entitled to obedience from their subjects by anything that Paul writes down. He says the people have a right. Now I want you to notice where it starts right here. Right here, this word it, he said, it would be stupid tameness and unaccountable folly for whole nations to suffer one unreasonable, ambitious, and cruel man, can anybody say Joe Biden, to wanton and riot in their ministry, uh, misery. Notice he said, it'd be stupid tameness and folly for us to sit here and do nothing. But what do we do? For the most part, we sit here and do nothing. Joseph Lathrop says the same thing. He says Christians have a right to stand up and say no. Even Thomas Jefferson put it in the Declaration of Independence. Remember he said the job of government is to protect your rights, and when it stops doing that, it is the right, and later on he says the duty of the people to do what? To alter it, to abolish it, or throw it off. It's what I call DEFCON 3, 2, 1. If we act quickly, we can alter our government. Well, we've shot right past that. The second thing he says, if you've waited too long, 
And you can't alter it. You have to abolish it. You have to wipe it clear and start over. I think we've gone past that. Then he says, if you've waited too long, you have to fight. A lot of people ask me, Dan, where are we? I believe we're right between DEFCON 2 and DEFCON 1. And if the church does not rise up and start teaching these things and preaching these principles and getting people engaged, we're going to lose it all. So to kind of begin to wrap it up, standing against tyrants does not make us rebels. In fact, it makes us protectors of what is right. This is Dr. Alice Baldwin. If you're interested in, in this kind of history, you need to go online and look her up. You can even buy the book that I'm going to quote from here. But I want you to notice what she says. Probably the most fundamental principle of the American constitutional system is the principle that no one is bound to obey an unconstitutional act. No single idea was more fully stressed, no principle more often repeated through the first 60 years of the 18th century than that governments must obey law and that he who resisted one in authority who was violating that law was not himself a rebel but a protector of the law. It's the opposite of what we've been told over and over and over. Samuel Cooper, he said, look, in the revolution, we're not rebelling here. We're trying to restore constitutional government. And I could go on and on and on. Now, I want to give you just a few more illustrations, and I'm going to close. Most of you have probably never seen this, but this is the original national seal that was recommended to the Continental Congress by three. Two of them were told the most godless people among the framers. Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, and John Adams. They were tasked with designing the national seal. They presented this design to Congress on August the 20th, 1776. Now, I want you to notice what they suggested our national seal should look like. Rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. Here's Moses and the children of Israel. There's the pillar of fire and the pillar of, of, of a cloud. That's God's presence, the Shekinah glory. And this is the Egyptian army being drowned in the Red Sea. That's what those three guys wanted our national seal to be. Don't you wish that Congress had adopted that? Wouldn't that be a cool national seal? And by the way, just as a side note, we're told that Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin were godless deists and heathens. Well, why would godless deists and heathens suggest that be our national seal? Could it be because they were not godless deists and heathens? Yeah, we've been lied to about our framers. So I want to I end with two quotes, but I wanna, one of them is a story and then a, a last quote. This is the best portrait I can find of Samuel Phillips Payson. I normally try to get real high-res images, but it's the only one available. He was a pastor in what today is Boston, but in his day was a separate little town called Chelsea, Massachusetts. Now Samuel Phillips Payson pastored that church and all through the atrocities of the British, he was against standing up against them. I don't know that he was a pacifist, but he just wasn't in for declaring independence because he knew that would probably mean we're going to have to fight the British and I don't think we ought to do that. But something happened. The, the Redcoats fired on his neighbors at Lexington in the morning of April the 19th, 1775. Now, I want you to listen what a historian wrote about what happened in the life of this preacher. The brutal outrage at Lexington transformed this peaceful scholar and meek divine into the fiery, intrepid soldier, and seizing a musket, he put himself at the head of a party and led them forward to the attack. Now, the group that he gathered was a group of Minutemen. So he's, this preacher is now carrying a flintlock musket, their assault weapon of their day. Okay? So notice what he does then. The gentle voice that had so long spoken only words of peace suddenly rung like that of a prophet of old. A body of British soldiers advancing along them, uh, 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 excuse me, along the road. That's the road that goes from Concord to Boston. If you were here last night, I actually talked about how the Americans fought the British at, at the Old North Bridge at Concord and the British began to retreat. So all these pastors gather up the men of their churches and they're lining the road and they're firing away at the British as they're going back to Boston. Many of them are preachers, including this guy. Notice he goes on to say, he poured into them such a destructive volley. What is a destructive volley? Musket balls coming out of the ends of flintlock muskets pushed forward by black powder. 
And if those musket balls hit you, they're going to knock a massive hole in you and you almost likely die. So that's this preacher firing his musket and telling others with him. Now, this is the same guy that had been saying we shouldn't separate and fight the British. But when he heard about how the British had fired on his neighbors over there in Lexington, he said, that cuts it. He gathered up a bunch of men, got his own flintlock, hid in the bushes beside Battle Road and began to fire away at the Redcoats as they were retreating from Concord back to Boston. Let me finish it up. He was a man of peace and conciliation, but the first citizen's blood that crimsoned the green grass made a clean sweep of all his arguments and objections, and he entered with his whole soul into the struggle. Notice the transformation that took place in that man. Friends, what is it going to take for us to be transformed? Now, I'm not talking just about spiritual transformation. I'm talking about sitting on the, on the sidelines, twiddling our thumbs, saying, boy, I hope they do something. You know who the they is? We. It's we the people, not they the people. Boy, I hope they do something. And we all just sit here, and we won't speak out, and we won't talk about these things, and we're losing our liberties. So at the very end here, what am I trying to say? Well, what I'm trying to say is that we shouldn't misuse Scripture to silence people. Now, you know what? If I was a communist, that's exactly what I'd want. I'd want the preachers to shut up. I'd want the Christians to stay in their seats. Go ahead and just worship in the church house. But now, don't take that stuff outside. See, if I was a communist, that's what I'd want. Why do you think we've all been taught the separation of church and state? Because we've all heard it all of our lives. Why do you think you're constantly taught, uh, taught political correctness by the world? Because they want to shut us up. You know what the largest group in America that meets every week is? The church. And it was the church that let out in the war. Now, this is a Methodist preacher. His name was Charles Galloway. And he's preaching to a convention of preachers in the late 1800s at Emory College. And I want you to listen to what he said about the preachers and the Christians of the War of Independence. He said, Mighty men they were of iron nerve and strong hand and unblanched cheek and heart of flame. Is that how you would describe most preachers today? God, most preachers today don't even have a spine. In fact, Paul Blair and I, I've suggested that we come up with what, what I would call spinomatic, where, where you have vertebra you know, plastic ones, and they have a spring. They're all put together with a spring. And so you, you load them down into a box, and when you open it, it goes wing like that, and out comes a spine. And we send that to pastors at Christmas time and say, this is here, this is your spinomatic. Maybe you can somehow stick it up in there and grow you a backbone again. <laughs> because in the American church, we're spineless. So he goes on to say, God needed not reed shaken by the wind, not men clothed in soft raiment. What did he need then? But heroes of hardihood and lofty courage to be the voice of a new kingdom crying here in this western wilderness. God needed heroes of hardihood. Friends, that's what God is calling on today. Now, I'm not calling us to war. Nobody wants a, a fight of bullets and bombs. But I'm telling you, the scriptures do not command that you offer unlimited submission to tyrants. And we need to stop hiding behind the Bible. Would you bow your heads with me and let's pray? Before I pray, I always want to say, friend, the most important thing you need is liberty from your sins. You need to be set free. If you don't know Jesus, I would encourage you to give your life to him today. But if you're a believer and you already know the Lord, God is calling you to stand for what is right. And we have to skillfully handle God's word. And we can't hide behind things that make it look like we're being bold when really all we're being is cowardly and we're just hiding behind the Bible. Incorrectly read and understood. It's time for God's people to get engaged. Father, in Jesus' name, we come to you this morning. Thank you for this time that we've had together. Lord, I pray that you'd take these words and drive them into our hearts. God, we don't want to fight we don't want to be crossways with people. We don't want trouble. But Lord, trouble has found us. And it is time for your church to stop muzzling the pastors. It is time for your church to stop muzzling themselves, all claiming that they're doing so because of Romans 13. 
It's time for the church to stand and to begin to proclaim what is right and not apologize and not whisper, but to scream it through a megaphone. The world needs to hear. The world needs to see a church that is bold, humble before you, yes, submitted to proper authority, of course, but a church that will not sit there while tyranny happens all around them. God, help us not to wait until it's too late. I pray that you'd build a fire in us. Lord, I pray this in the name of Jesus. And for those who, Lord, do not know you, I pray they'd come to know you as Savior. For the rest of us, God, help us to fight the good fight. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for allowing me to share with you this morning. God bless you, brother.